Abonne gerne, wir leben nicht mehr. Ich, ich, ich. Ui, 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 ui. Abonne gerne, 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 gerne. Welcome to Paleontological Mystery Hour with C.M. Kozeman. Today we're going to have a little short podcast, but we're going to talk about something big, something big and extraordinary. Now, I get asked a lot, a lot of questions. What do you think was the strangest animal? And I'm sure you have seen websites or these clickbait articles discussing the weirdest prehistoric animals. So ad infinitum but there's one prehistoric animal which to my mind is a real like ball breaker a real paleontological enigma to me this animal named Typhloesus welsi is perhaps the strangest fossil animal now of course the there's a rich subculture of bizarre uh, unsolvable paradoxical fossil animals and this literature this folklore starts from studying the animals of the cambrian explosion by now they are almost mainstream i mean you're not cool enough if you go and say yeah i think opabinia was weird opabinia that five-eyed, nozzle-faced, strange, arthropod-like creature. Or if you go like saying, Animalocaris was really quite weird. Well, I'm sorry, man. You're just not cool if you say this in 2020. Because Animalocaris is almost mainstream now. But these are bizarre animals in their own right. People used to think they were... People couldn't even identify them properly. Animalocaris was once thought to be three different animals. Its body was interpreted as a big sponge or sea squirt. Its mouth disc was interpreted as a pineapple-like jellyfish. And part of its feeding appendage was interpreted as a kind of strange crayfish-like animal. But anyway, then we came to this stage, especially after Conway Morris, the famous paleontologist, took a look at these animals. And he, he believed they were like these unclassifiable offshoots, extinct phyla, he called them. These bizarre offshoots from the main line of animal evolution. And now today's consensus is a bit more moderated. We don't think they are alien phyla. But we think they nest pretty close to the root of the emergence at which invertebrate arthropod animals began to diversify. So that's the consensus these days. I mean, we don't consider them to be alien phylums or unknown phylums these days because, hey, guess what? The definition of phylum has become obsolete. We don't look at animal evolution in, term, in terms of boxes. You know, you got the phylum box and inside that you have the order box and whatever. Now we just look at everything in a big, enormous, tangled tree of life. And this way of looking at life is called cladistics. And cladistically speaking, yes, these Cambrian animals are pretty unique, but they don't form an alien root. You know, they're just branches pretty close to the main trunk of the radiation of life. So they've become <clears throat> somewhat mainstream and their origins are somewhat more properly understood. Oh, but this animal, this animal that we're going to talk about today, it's a whole other beast entirely. It is called, as I mentioned before, Typhlo Estus Wealthy. If you want to Google this, just spell T-Y-P-H-L-O-E-S-U-S. -E and the second name is W E L L S I. And it comes from the Carboniferous period, Bear Gulch formation. So, if you know about the history of life, the Carboniferous period isn't actually close to the Cambrian age at all. It's, a, it's an age at which fish have begun to diversify, and they're pretty much the dominant animals on, in the seas. And if I'm not mistaken, in the same period, 
period of life, we got the earliest vertebrates coming ashore to the land. So it's no Cambrian wonderland. You know, by the time Typhlo Esus evolved or lived, the world was still a bizarre place, but the main groups of animals were pretty well established. You could bet on fish to dominate the seas and probably the land too. And invertebrates were there. There were a lot of cephalopods, echinoderms, the ancestors of the natuloids and other um, belemnites. All those guys were there. In fact, the, some of the fish were pretty modern. I mean, we had bony fish there, colicant-like animals. We had lobe-finned fish, which are the colicant-like animals. The bony fish are more like regular vanilla fish. There were acanthodians in this formation. Acanthodians are these strange spiny fish with multiple fins. They make up a different lineage of fish evolution. You had things like lampreys and you had many, many strange formations of shark. So many and so weird that we could make three or four podcasts about these sharks alone. There were things called petalodonts, which were very like truncated, chunky, almost almost monkfish like sharks with a strange kind of teeth they were really unique then there was this other bizarre animal called the harpago fututor which was like a shark stretched out like a moray eel covered with spiny teeth like protuberances and the males had claw like things coming out of their mouths it was a very strange animal but not as strange as this thing we're going to discuss now. The, if you're really interested in the fish of the Bear Gulch formation, I strongly suggest you to visit the Fossil Fishes of Bear Gulch website, which you can see in the video description and on the pinned comment down below. But now let's get to business. So this was the environment in which this thing lived. Now we have... Tifloesus. I'm trying to. I will try to describe it to you. Although you could see a likeness of it in the background of this video's image, but it's this kind of blobby, unrecognizable, elongated thing. It almost looks like a very, very fat fish type. Imagine you made a soap sculpture of a fish and you use that soap for various purposes for a couple of months, and it's the kind of slimy outline and as far as scientists were able to discern this animal which was 90 millimeters long so 10 centimeters not really big it seems to have this kind of undefined head and then there's a foregut going into it and then in some fossils you can see this big chamber in the stomach area but guess what as far as we can see, there's no ass. No ass in this dude. Well, this might actually be an artifact of preservation, but most fossils really show this gut, but they show no way out. It's an assless fish-like blob. Although, if you consider its anatomy a, a bit more, maybe there was an ass, we just can't see it. Because right below this big gut chamber, there's this unique organ no one can make sense of called the ferrodiscus organ. Now, the ferrodiscus organ consists of two iron-rich and thus dark disc-like tissues. And it's immediately below the bizarre uh, gut area. And this is why the assless thing might be a caveat, because in some fossils you could see this kind of blobby space between this mysterious ferrodiscus organ and the gut. So maybe the gut did, the animal did have its ass, it was just in sandwiched in between the discs that made up this ferrodiscus organ. So maybe it's just an ass we can't see. But that's the problem with a lot of these bizarre paradoxical fossils. The, the fossils themselves are so small and so difficult to interpret. Anything could be anything. Now this ferrodiscus organ P. 
people say it might be a kind of breathing or blood supply organ. It might be a buoyancy chamber. It might be giant eyes as far as I know. Or it might be this kind of bizarre uh, part of the digestive system that kind of guarded the way to the anus. No one knows, no one can tell. We only have the blobs on the rock. And here we are, millions of years later, playing like fortune tellers, trying to solve these mystical enigmas. Oh, but it gets, it gets even better. Because Typhloesus is also a fossil that contains other fossils. And these other fossils are almost as strange as Typhloesus itself. Because uh, now we have to open another chapter in this podcast to discuss conodont animals. Kona, don't! Don't do that! Because, jokes aside, these were like, Kona don't means coom toothed or something. So, throughout fossil deposits, scientists always notice this very small, but like tiny, microscopic, teeth-like fossils. You know, no one could really tell what they were. Some people thought they belonged to arthropods. Some people thought they were parts of fish-like animals or larva, no one knew. But then we discovered some fossils and we now know that the conodont animals, which are extremely diverse and there's many kinds of them, not just in the Bear Gulch formation, but in many other marine formations as well. These things were attached to this very kind of spaghetti thin, roughly lamprey-like animal with big eyes. And if you Google images for conodonts, you can see many ridiculous depictions of these animals. They look like they're screaming all the time. And I guess that's just bad paleo art because I guess if these animals were alive, you really wouldn't be able to see the teeth from anywhere outside the animal. But a lot of the artwork showing these animals have to show the teeth. So all the conodonts look like they're screaming, Kona, don't! Anyways, so at the end it was revealed the conodont animals were distant relatives of the chordate, chordates. That is to say the major group of animals that include the lampreys and also in a way bony fish as well. So imagine they were like tiny fluke-sized lamprey relatives with, sharp, with sharpish teeth. Now what you might ask... What links these conodont animals to Typhloesus? Well, here's a bizarre answer. Typhloesus fossils in the Bear Gulch formation contain conodont animals. But here the mystery really gets scary. There are no other conodont fossils known elsewhere in Bear Gulch. Only the Typhloesus fossils which number more than 50, have them. They're inside it, as if they're riding a little bus to work, off to do conodont work, and get paid, and go home, and look at their conodont iPhones. But it's obvious that these Typhloesus animals are eating these conodonts, but you can't find a single fossil conodont outside of the Typhloesus animals. So it brings up some strange questions, and here we're going to enter speculation zone, because that's one of the main points of this channel, speculating. It looks like it also doesn't have an ass. So one wonders if Typhloesus was part of the conodont animal's reproductive cycle. Maybe there were a strange morph of conodont reproduction that sheltered these things, much like a parasite and a host. Maybe it was, in fact, a part of the conodont life cycle itself that these things grew up nursing and containing the animals and died uh, when their duty was done. Once again, I have to remind you, these are pure speculation. It's actually more likely that Typhloesus was a very specialized predator on conodonts, 
I don't know how it found them. I don't know how it ate them. Doesn't even seem to have eyes. But somehow it was very good at sniffing conodonts. Maybe it attracted some sort of smell or a chemical that attracted these conodonts to it. Or maybe the ferrodiscus organ helped it, helped it dive to an extreme depth and withstand compression. No one knows. But this scenario really seems like plausible, I don't know, maybe not plausible, but thought-provoking in a playful sort of way. To imagine these paradoxical conodont animals with an extra life cycle that has few parallels elsewhere in the animal world. Maybe Typhloesus was the reproductive bus for the conodonts. So the life cycle would run, the conodonts would go out and mate. And maybe, actually, this is just occurring to me right now. Wait, wait, scratch the whole thing. So, conodont animals are the larvas of Typhloesus. How about that? How about, it's, it's a bit like caterpillars and butterflies or maggots and flies. You know, some of these insects we have today, the larva does all the flying and eating. No, doesn't do the flying because it's a maggot. But the larva does all the feeding. And when the fly or the butterfly comes out of it, in some groups, they don't even have mouth parts. The moth or the fly, when it happens, is just a flying, fucking, dying, reproducing machine. That's all it does. It reproduces, sheds some eggs, and dies. So this mechanism has evolved two times or even more among the insects. So maybe it may have evolved similarly with the conodont animals too. So this is just occurring to me as I record this talk, so bear with me if there's a logical fallacy in what I'm about to describe. But imagine the conodonts are actually the larvas. They do all the feeding, they scurry about in the seafloor or wherever it is they live. And when the time comes, the lucky ones that get to survive, get pregnant, grow really fat, and develop all these other conodont animals inside them. So they are like a reproductive female, almost like a queen conodont, whose only purpose is to shelter these offspring. And the cycle of life begins again. Thought provoking, but I don't know. I'm not a paleontologist. I haven't studied any fossils of Typhloesus or conodonts. If someone studies these fossils and they see that the conodonts inside Typhloesus are all of the same type, then maybe our brief hypothesis just now can gain a little more credibility. But if they turn out to be from different species, then the obvious thing was the truth all along. Typhloesus is a strange thing that has specialized to seek out and eat these conodonts. Well, it's a mystery in a world of mysteries. But when people ask me, what's the strangest organism? I always tell them Typhloesus. Because you don't even know which way it stands. It does it swim? And, and the whole conodont mystery also adds a strange context to it that none of the other strange prehistoric organisms have. You got an interesting fossil, but that's it. Now, this animal's life cycle, either in food or reproduction, somehow involves another paradoxical fossil. It's like, it's like one of those Russian dolls. You open a doll, pork inside is a smaller doll. And you open that, pork is an even smaller one. And you open that, and that's it. Okay, guys. Hope you like this short podcast and please share your ideas about what Typhloesus might be, how its relations to the conodonts might be. Just, you know, speculate away. This page, this whole YouTube page exists just for that. 
if I make even one of you think in an unusual way about life and past and the evolution of life, I consider my job done for today. So there. But I also consider my job done for today even better if you can just donate to me from Patreon, which is also in the video description. You know, when recording this video, I just had a cup of coffee. Guess what? Your Patreon money bought that coffee. If, you, if more of you support me, I'll keep producing these videos at a higher frequency. And as always, by the way, before going, also if you're more curious about Typhloesus and the Conodont and everything else from the Bear Gulch Formation, please check the link in the video description and the pinned comment. And as always, keep your sense of curiosity alive and sharp because in this world of mysteries, a sense of curiosity really makes life happier, if not more tolerable. That's it, everyone. Have a nice evening. Bye.